I never thought I'd find myself packing for a cross-country road trip, chasing after an obsolete piece of machinery that no one wants. Lathes, mills, shapers, grinders, they're all relics of a different era of machining. Not only are they big, heavy, and hard to move, they take a long time to master. And on top of that, this shop is bursting at the seams with such equipment. There's literally no room for anything else. But when you catch wind of something you've always wanted that might be headed for the scrapyard, you don't ask questions. You run a truck, pack your bags, and go. right when I go to start recording we pull up on some traffic so I don't really know what I'm gonna say got 12 hours in the car with you anything could come out of my mouth was gonna say that we were blasting our way across Indiana um, but at the moment we are not we are crawling going to pick up a machine that I've wanted for a while a very nice man named Mike near Minneapolis saw my wish list video and uh, offered me his machine and I've had several of these offers come through basically for free, as long as I could move it, kind of giving me the opinion that this is a machine that nobody wants. So I'm maybe, I don't know, three or four hours in. I'm like halfway between Indianapolis and Chicago, I think. I always liked road trips. A lot of the road trips I would take with my grandparents, all you had was the radio, and if you didn't listen to the radio, you came up with things to talk about. Or one of the things I remember my grandfather doing was he knew exactly how many miles it was, the gear ratios of his transmission, and the final drive ratio of the differential, and he would back calculate exactly how many times the exhaust valve lifted on the entire trip from like Cincinnati to Oklahoma. No. Oh. I think my favorite thing in the whole world might be traffic. I wonder how many cars I've passed going the other direction in five hours of driving. Probably like 10 a second, 3,600 seconds in an hour times five. Probably passed 150,000 cars, 150,000 different cars. And I'm only in one small part of the US. That's a lot of fucking cars. Now there are a lot of logistics to consider on this trip. First time we tried to schedule it, we ended up getting snowed out. Plus the rental and the tie downs and the driving. It was a bit hectic. Fortunately though, the one thing I didn't have to think about was my luggage, thanks to today's sponsor, Ridge. By now, probably everybody knows about Ridge's flagship product, their wallets. And yeah, they're pretty great. The compact design comes in tons of different styles and colors and it's super secure. So I never have to worry about my cards falling out at gas station munchie stops. Same goes for the Ridge key cases. They keep everything all in one nice little package and no more rattling. But what I found especially awesome on this trip was some of Ridge's other products, like their 20 liter waterproof commuter backpack. It has like a bajillion pockets, but still maintains a sleek design so it doesn't look like you strapped on some dorky cargo pants to your back. And it has adjustable inner dividers that make it great for sorting clothes, AV equipment, or your daily regimen of vitamin C. And there's a standalone cushioned laptop compartment so you don't mix up your apples and oranges. Ridge took their high product standards into other cool pieces of tech as well. Like this self-winding watch with a clear back so you can see all the cool workings inside. So it never runs out of battery and helps me keep track of exactly how long it took my ass to go numb in this seat. Or their bolt action pen which was really helpful when a police officer asked me for my autograph on this really weird piece of paper. With Father's Day right around the corner, head to ridge.com and use code inheritance or follow the link in the description to save up to 40% on top products this Father's Day. Thanks to Ridge for sponsoring this video and for making this road trip just a little bit easier. Mike? <laughs> How's it going? Good, how are you? Wasn't too bad a drive, was it? No, not bad at all. I've never done this kind of filming before. <laughs> that was, uh, I bought it from South Bend when they were still in business. Oh, so you're the original owner. Yeah. Wow. I love the way the, the tool room lathes, I don't know that that's a tool room lathe, but I love how they come with the solid base and the yeah. drawers and the cabinets, that's how the hard end is. Look at, look at how the old yeah. salt bends were, they had that cast iron bottom. Yeah. I mean, everything is pretty much that's... brand new bearings, I had to replace a bunch of bearings. Okay, so yeah, it doesn't have a, a, it doesn't have a feed shaft. 
I don't even see it back here. Yeah, that's the LeBlanc, that's uh, 15 inch. That's that servo drive. It looks like almost dead exactly the same size as mine. Yeah, this is the only lathe I have digital readout on. Really? You're doing everything else manual. That's impressive. <laughs> so how long have you been collecting and yeah. A <laughs> long time. Long time? Since about, since the 80s, okay. 86. I was say, you've got some really mint condition equipment. It's hard to find anything in this kind of condition. Yeah. This is the beast. Yeah. <laughs> you ever hear of shapers? Oh yeah, yeah. I want one. Pretty. I have no need for one, but I want one. It cost me more to deliver it than it did uh, That's the thing about a lot was. of this equipment. Yeah. Especially the older stuff is, yeah. it just Heavy costs more to move it than. I mean, it's all cast iron, you know, it's beautiful. This came out of a high school. I don't think it was used much. Still got all the scraper marks wow. on it. All right, we've driven 12 hours. You've waited in suspense while I toured Mike's awesome shop. What are we actually getting? A pantograph. A pantograph is a special type of milling machine used for duplicating and engraving, and it's basically become obsolete since the advent of CNC. In fact, that's exactly why Mike is parting with this one, because he got a CNC machine. But being somewhat CNC resistant myself, and also finding these machines cooler than cool, I couldn't pass up the offer. A few different companies make these kinds of machines, but the ones I've always had my eye on are the Decals. This is a model GK12, and I never really expected to find one in the US because these are manufactured in Germany, but here we are. Fortunately for me, amongst Mike's collection is a tractor with forks on it, so it should be no trouble to get this loaded. Piece of cake. Obviously, I can't thank Mike enough for his generosity and for letting me tour his awesome setup. A tour that continued for several hours after loading the machine. But after a full afternoon of geeking out and sharing a meal, it's time to make the 12 hour journey back to Kentucky. Stand in front of it, and what I'll do is pick it up a little bit and okay. scoot it back. Okay. As they say, it takes a village to build a machine shop. And after some much appreciated help from my well-equipped neighbor, the pantograph is safe at home. Well, almost. Which is on the other side of this pile of mess in the garage, so bear with me. After my last nightmare of maneuvering a not so small, small lathe into the shop, I wised up and bought something that would have made everything a whole lot easier. An aptly named shop crane, with some assembly required. Looks like I got it together right. I mean, I followed the directions. So let's see if it's up for the job. Ah, hold on. I need to make a decision first. Where the hell am I going to put this? When I brought the last lathe in here, I maxed out the capacity of this shop. And these walls aren't just going to move because I have no self-control. So something's going to have to go. Can you guess what? You're probably also wondering how I'm going to get the machine through the door. And the short answer is, I'm not. You see, in my wiser years, when I built this shop, I made the decision to make this wall removable. So once all this stuff is out of the way, I just have to remove this outlet and wire, and this whole wall segment will just pop out. But before I let all the spring humidity come rushing in, I want to make sure I can actually pick up the pantograph.
Well, that puckered my button a little bit. But we're safely off the pallet, so let's get the wall out of the way. Sixteen hundred miles and twenty four hours of driving and the Panagraph is safe in its new spot. And I gotta say it looks right at home amongst all my other machines. But there's one small issue. This belt pulley needs some room, otherwise it'll just rub a hole through the wall. So I'll try turning this on an angle to give myself some more room. Yeah, I really like that. It gives a lot more room to get around the machine to reach everything I need to, and generally just looks nice standing out like this. Now, I'm chomping at the bit to clean and play with this, but I'll do the responsible thing first and put the shop back together. And that also means saying goodbye to the drafting table. I'm afraid the older panograph pulls rank in this situation. Don't worry, I'll try to find a way to bring it back in here soon. Now I mentioned this thing is old. By my reckoning, and the paperwork that this came with, I believe it's from the 1960s. And usually with old machines comes dirt, and rust, and grime. But this thing is in amazing condition. A little bit of surface rust here and there, and a little bit of old grease and grime. But overall, it's in great shape. So this cleanup should be pretty easy. I'll start like I've done with all my other cleanups and work on the important surfaces first with some Scotch-Brite and penetrating oil. Now wait for it, wait for it. Oh. Mm. Yeah, that's nice. The Scotch-Brite works perfect for all the metal surfaces, but I don't need it scrubbing away the paint. So for all the delicate regions, I'll use a gentler degreaser and a rag. Last but not least is to make sure all the ways, screws, and bearings are properly lubricated. We don't want this thing rubbing itself into a pile of metal shavings. This is also a good spot to point out the insane condition of this machine. I mean, look at the flaking on the ways. I could be completely wrong, but my guess is that's all original, which would indicate that this machine was lightly used. Which is music to this second-hand owner's ears. Okay, okay, that's good enough. Let's play with this thing. I'm gonna start off with something simple. 
partially because I've never used a pantograph before, and largely because Mike gave me Buku lettering templates. And I think it's obvious what the first engraving should be. The letters are traced by a stylus that mounts in this end of the arm, and then I raise the platform to get the stylus to actually land in those letters' grooves. Now for the business end, or should I say the business expense end. This engraver isn't going to be very useful without engraving bits, so I bought several. Nice. Oh, you stupid fuck. It may have been a business expense, but it still hurts. Note to self, don't let go of the frickin' cutter until it's tight. Good thing I bought several. Just when you thought we were ready to go, surprise, more setup. With this pantograph, I can scale things down from whatever the template is by moving these joints around. I think I'll start with a one to two scale, half scale for my American viewers. Last thing, I swear, and this one's important. We need some material to engrave. I'll choose some beginner friendly aluminum. The cutter spindle is on a quick retract, so I'll get this in the down position and raise the platform until it almost touches the material. Then I can retract the spindle and set the cutting depth using this fancy little contraption. One final check to make sure we're centered on the test piece, and more importantly not going to wreck into anything, and then we're ready to rock. The rest of this is better explained by seeing it in action, so let's just enjoy these first chips. Okay, I love this. It's so incredibly cathartic to trace over the letters and watch them just materialize over on the other platen. And my excitement for finally panographing for the first time isn't even diminished by the fact that I broke yet another engraving bit. I mean, just look how nice the results look. But what I really want to see is how it looks even smaller. Let's give quarter scale a go. In case it isn't obvious how this pantograph is able to scale movements like this, it's really just a matter of proportions. The closer the cutter spindle is to the main pivot point, the more the movements are reduced. Just like this wrench, a lot of distance out at the end is reduced down to smaller and smaller distances as you reach the head. It may seem more complicated with the extra arms on this machine, but they're basically just to make this reduction possible in the two-dimensional space. Is it just me or does that look even better? Well now I have to know what it looks like at 8th scale. Okay, I hate to sound like a broken record, but I am in love. That looks so effing good. Maybe now I can finally put my maker's mark on some of the tools I've made. But not right now. I'm not done playing. While this pantograph is spectacular for engraving letters, that's like using your Bugatti exclusively for getting the mail at the end of your driveway. So let's engrave something a little more complicated. Like this frilly little dude on my grandfather's retirement plaque. Very nice. Let's turn it up another notch still. We've already talked about how this can duplicate in two dimensions, but what if I told you it does 3D as well? Well get ready because it does this in 3D. By removing this bolt, it frees up the arm to move up and down, giving that third axis that makes it possible to duplicate just about anything. 
so let's try something with a three-dimensional profile, like this motorcycle engine valve cover. Aside from just mounting the part and some material, there's a little extra planning involved here too. First is the stylus. I'm going to be using a 3 16 ball end mill in the spindle, so I need a stylus to match the shape, but it also needs to match the scale. So I whipped up a ball end stylus and some nylon that's 1.5 times larger than the ball mill, or at least approximate enough for this little exercise. The second piece of the setup is that the stylus and cutter need to be in a straight line with the main pivot back here. Original from the factory, this machine included a so-called former bracket for helping set this up, but this pantograph unfortunately got separated from its bracket long ago, so I'll use the next best thing. My right eyeball. Just kidding. Well, sort of. I did eyeball a straight edge with the center pivot, and then used it to set the height of the cutter and the stylus. Okay, let's give it a go. I'll say one thing, this isn't a fast process, but it is pretty satisfying to watch the full shape emerge out of the raw block of aluminum. And it's actually really interesting to feel the feedback of the cutter as it works through the material. You can actually feel the difference between climb and conventional milling. It gets a little carried away if I don't limit the depth though, so I'm using this bump stop back at the pivot to incrementally work my way deeper and deeper while keeping everything manageable. Well, that looks a fair bit better than I thought it would. The finish isn't dead smooth, but considering I don't know what I'm doing, I'll say that's fair enough. The only real downside is it's not a one-to-one -one duplication. If I wanted to make a two-thirds scale replica of the engine I snagged this from, it's perfect. But a like-for-like -like copy just isn't happening on this machine. Unless there's a way to modify it. I'll keep such conjectures to myself for now because I have a visitor I know will appreciate this new addition to the shop. My wife. I did the Panabari. I did the pantograph. You did the pantograph? Okay. I gotta go get them. All that time and you're not prepared? I Sorry. had to hide them. All right. How about that one? Oh, <gasps> it's tiny! Oh, yeah. look at the tiny! That's really sharp. That's eighth scale. Eighth scale. How yeah. small does this go? Tenth. Oh, <gasps> really? So you can make it even smaller. That yeah. looks awesome. So I was doing the, I did the big one first and got to the last E in inheritance and broke the bit. Oh no! So I broke both of my 30 degree bits and then I did quarter scale. So uh -huh. that's half of that. And then that's half of that. Like, is this your maker's mark or are you just testing? I was just testing. I do wonder, like, how hard was the R? If you cut over something, it's, it like doesn't double cut. It's not like a spring pass or anything where it takes off a little bit more? I mean, maybe, but it's like so small, you're not going to see I guess it. it doesn't really matter. I want to make the IM, like the box. Logo. So you, you probably could make the box reasonably well. I guess it's a rule of the shop, though, that all the mills sit on 45 degrees, so. Yes. Well, it looks really nice. It's like, it a, it's like a stadium of tooling. Specimen number two. <gasps> oh, you're in trouble. You're in so much trouble. Do you know how many things I'm gonna have you make that have swirly girls on them? Was this in one of the templates? No, that's my grandfather's plaque. It's on the corner. Literally just C-clamp that to the table <laughs> and trace to the... Oh, that is so pretty. All right. This worked way better than I thought it would. Oh my gosh. So it's, the, it's a 3D pantograph. So like it can literally just follow contours and shapes. This was done with a ball mill. And the, like that, all that took like an hour to do. Up next, you're gonna make something. No, no, what? Did you have this planned? Yes. I don't know what you're gonna make. You get to pick out the words you wanna make. There's all kinds okay. of letters over there. All right. I will get this set up while you're thinking. I haven't had to think this much about spelling since like I got a smartphone. <laughs> what yeah. scale do you want? Uh, Itsy bitsy teeny weeny. Forget about the polka dot bikini. Ignore the fact that I'm using a uh, crescent wrench because I don't have the appropriate spanner. I don't know how to read. I don't know how to alphabetize apparently, so we're even. I can't sort these and this is pissing me off, so I'm just gonna use put the, them. Use the, literally use that one. That one's in order. This one's in order? Yeah. Why do you want to do it on brass? <laughs> I learned from the best. <laughs> brass was the first thought, but I want it on a block and I don't want to use all of your expensive brass block. 
need to do some hand wheel stuffs. I would mean. venture to say that this machine has never been operated by someone wearing a dress. <laughs> That's probably a pretty fair guess. I'll help you set the depth on every one of them, so don't worry. Okay, so I just have to do like the bare minimum to... to say that I did it. All right, we're gonna turn it on. Look at you all smug. That actually looks really good. Looks pretty darn good. That's as small as I can go with these letters. If I had smaller letters, yeah. I could go even smaller, but I'd, the, the lines are kind of thick, so I don't know that I would go. It's smooth too. Like it doesn't leave like a burr or anything. You're a natural. I'll do some tests on steel before I actually engrave anything on the, any of my existing tools. That's a good idea. Because that would be Philly. Are we selling these? It's missing one critical feature. This block doesn't have any chamfers on it. You can't have a chamfer block that well, doesn't have chamfers on it. Yeah, you can because that's part of the project. Ah, this is the, here it is. The I'm going to make the blocks that say ch hashtag, hashtag chamfer it on it. And it's up to the, the buyer to chamfer it. Yes. It's a command. Limited run. Limited run in the description. You can get your own project block. Yeah. You made you a block. Where are you going to put it? I thought it was going to stay down here. Yeah. Where are you going to put it? We're going to put it. Well, I think that about wraps up this whirlwind of a project. Machine acquired, wife approved, and we even got a little memento out of it. And I have to say thank you to Mike once again for his unbelievable donation to the shop. It's honestly so surreal to finally have a panograph and in such nice condition at my disposal. I'm really looking forward to using it in my projects and seeing what this machine can really do. As always, thanks for watching and see you next time. Short shorts. Oh, I wear short shorts. I think I'd get used to that camera being on that gantry. I whack my noodle on it all the time. Don't you tempt me with your seductive <laughs> shapes over there. I think you're working on the wrong crank if you're trying to be ooh, to ooh, deal ooh, with ooh, being ooh, tempted. Ooh, 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 ooh. You have business things to talk to me about? Yeah. Okay. Can we go talk about business things? Let's go talk about business Horizontally. things. Horizontally? <laughs> yes. Yes?